think it's actually going. I think it's already switched over. 
Hello everyone, welcome to the Thursday Featured Artist Lecture Series with William J. O'Brien. Our program will be starting in approximately 10 minutes. You were saying that I was like stepping out of the booth out here or something. Thank you. 
Hello everyone, welcome again. The program is about to begin, so if you are planning on sitting in the house, please come get your seat. Good afternoon, and welcome, welcome. I'm Nancy Wilhelms, I'm the Executive Director of Anderson Ranch Arts Center, and I'm absolutely delighted that you're here today. Before we begin our presentation with William J. O'Brien, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Toby Lewis. Yes. I'd also like to thank our National Council sponsors, as well as our corporate and media sponsors and other sp supporters of today's program. So thank you all. Yes. So in a moment, I'd like to bring up Larry Fields, who's going to introduce our speaker today. Uh, a little bit about Larry. Larry and his wife, Marilyn, who is also here, have a long-term relationship with Anderson Ranch, and they are National Council supporters of the Summer Series program. They are important art collectors from Chicago, where they are deeply involved with the Museum of Contemporary Art and the very lively art scene in Chicago. So please welcome Larry Fields. Uh, pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, Chicago's in the house. It's always a pleasure to uh, start up with a Chicago artist. We've done, uh, as I thought last night, we had Nick Cave, uh, Theaster Gates, Angel Otero, and now Bill O'Brien. So we have a, a great, the great scene going on in the studio culture in Chicago, uh, and it's great to see them crossover to coming to uh, Snowmass uh, in Anderson Ranch. Uh, Bill just said the other uh, a few moments ago that what was it like to come here not knowing what to expect, and he really reiterated what everyone else says when they come here. It's warm, it's welcoming, welcoming, it's not intimidating, and you can go in there, jump right in, and feel very confident. It's going to be a great experience. And that's uh, all the way through, and that's one of the beautiful things about the Anderson Ranch. And uh, There's a uh, provenance about the artists who have come through here. Bill felt it in the uh, clay studio in the ceramics area. He could feel that the great artists that have been all the way uh, through the ages here and build up this provenance that is critically acclaimed throughout the United States. 
Um, Bill himself, a uh, young Bill O'Brien, is one of the younger artists out there when we consider uh, the Stellas of the world that uh, Marian Boski has in her wide program, Stella down to O'Brien, if you will. Um, the, uh, the idea of having the pulse of what's going on in the United States and the art scene uh, for a younger person is very interesting. Because when we live in a digital age, Bill O'Brien really works in the process of handmade uh, in, in the beautiful design and uh, primitive and naive art where uh, it takes a lot of courage to go there when now we're just doing things on computers and uh, artificial intelligence. But uh, he stays true to his aesthetic. Uh, he does a lot with process and he comes up with his works, a lot of it from cultural sources, uh, from tribal sources as well that are subtly integrated into his work. So Bill uh, went to the Loyola University in Chicago in the arts program and then went on for an MFA at the Art Institute, School of the Art Institute and materials um, and fibers, I believe, right? Yeah. And so from there, he got a, uh, a scholarship from the Artadia, the Artadia group for what he was doing. In 2011, they had a great show at the Renaissance Society. My wife Marilyn's on the board of the Renaissance Society, and they're known for finding young artists that are coming up in, uh, in the world with a, a unique talent that a lot of people uh, haven't yet to have a chance to see, and it's been, it was a great show. In 2014, we had the MCA do a, a cross-reference to all his work. Uh, it was a great retrospective of his work in 2014, whereas the Renaissance Society did strictly all of his ceramic works. Uh, in the MCA, we went all the way through his whole cross-media discipline, which is painting, uh, collage, uh, assemblage, uh, ceramics, uh, drawings, and uh, metal sculptures as well. Um, I'm sure if you look at his uh, drawings, you'll find out that uh, there's a word that I don't like to use too often in art, but they're beautiful. Uh, they're absolutely beautiful. It's a word that we sometimes neglect to see what, what, we, what we look at and say it's beautiful because it sounds so ordinary. But um, his idea of working with pattern and colors is very unique. Uh, he's got this uh, way of making it move uh, and making it exuberant and it's like a feel-good moment when you get a chance to be interact with those things. Um, he has more to say about what he does, uh, but please enjoy his process and how he explains it. You don't get an opportunity to hear Bill O'Brien speak too often. He's a quiet and reserved guy, but I'm sure today you'll enjoy what he has to say. Thank you. Well, Larry gave such a nice introduction. I feel like I don't really need to do my talk. Just kidding. <laughs> um, I kind of feel that artists, um, it's kind of like your birthday. Uh, there are certain people who will tell everyone about their birthday and they'll say, oh, hey, are you coming to my birthday party? My birthday is on this day. And then there are people who will not tell anyone about their birthday party. And I think artists are in the same way where um, I'm kind of more reclusive and I uh, have a tendency uh, to be more insular. And so never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that I'd be standing in front of this podium right now at this time of my life. But um, thankfully, <laughs> I'm able, um, it can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Um, so when I was thinking about this talk, I was really thinking about this question of like asking people about what would be the best way for me to actually talk about my work and to sort of introduce who I was. And everyone kept saying to me, um, well, Bill, just be yourself, right? And so <laughs> I was kind of really like asking myself that question because this question of being yourself can be very complicated. And especially if you are um, an emerging artist or an artist who's existing in many different chapters of your life, um, that can be evolving and touching base with this sense of genuinity is something that has been really important to me. And so when I was coming to... Uh, to form this talk, I was really thinking a lot about um, uh, who, what I did and sort of where I evolved from. And so the title of this talk that I came up with is Making is Thinking. And that, there were other two other titles I came up for this talk. The other one was uh, The Body is Smarter Than the Mind. And the other talk I was thinking about titling was The Beauty and the Beast. So it was kind of like this way of articulating and talking about uh, some of these things in my practice that I think makes sense in their connection, uh, but then also there's parts of my practice that do feel disparate, where it almost seems like different people are making different things in my work. Uh, so this question of uh, finding your position, being confident in what you confident in what you do as an artist is something that um, you would think would be easy, uh, but I think there's something about the artist talk that really is like a demonstration and a performance of process and kind of like shows hopefully 
uh, the audience uh, a little bit about the energy of the artist, but then also gives insight into their psychology and what they've been doing. Uh, and for me, most of my adult life, this is when technology, oh, hopefully it'll be fine, okay. Uh, for most of my adult life, I really felt that I didn't belong in my family. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I'm like, I don't belong to these people. I don't know how I was born into this family. <laughs> and so um, oftentimes when I talk to my students, I actually, you know, I think it's really important that when you uh, find your voice as an artist, it's really important that you have to go through your autobiography, that you really have to sort of establish, like in order to actually have something to say in the world, you actually have to understand where you came from. And so the beginning part of my talk really is about uh, presenting these very early influences that I think, I like to think of them as planting seeds in my practice and the way that things evolved eventually, where I do think this question of autobiography and planting seeds is really important because I think these very early influences really I think um, I can see now really shape the way that my work is existing. In Buddhism, there's a story that they say that we actually choose our parents, that we actually see them having sex and we say to ourselves, I am going to come down and I'm going to be with these people. And so once I heard this story about actually choosing my family, <laughs> it really changed the way that I was really thinking about uh, my family history. So I grew up outside of Cleveland, Ohio, which you could kind of say is a very pastoral uh, and beautiful place. There's like a very big Amish community that exists where I'm from. This shot is actually in Burton, Ohio, which is uh, about four or five miles from where I grew up, where growing up, probably very similar to the, you could say the landscape of growing up in a rural place like Aspen, was very much influenced by nature, but also had a very strong uh, connection to handicraft which was something that was very evident and influenced to me, uh, being exposed to like Amish culture, but then also feeling very connected to being outside in nature. When I was younger, I actually was um, played outside a lot. And when my mother uh, told me that I had to go to kindergarten, I was really resentful of her because <laughs> I felt that um, I didn't understand why I had to sit all day long. So there, a big part of my upbringing was uh, being connected to being outside and having a very strong influence of nature within me and my body and also this element of play. You could say my parents were kind of like this um, back to the earth type of uh, family. <laughs> uh, my mother was very uh, connected to the environment and also uh, I think to really raising me in a way that was um, feeling very connected to my physical body and my emotions, and also being very aware of my physical body. And I think this very early influence of my mother really instructing me, um, and you could say this 70s um, touchy-feely parenting, where I frequently did uh, group dialogue sessions with my parents where we would choose a topic and um, it would be talk about a time when you felt really embarrassed and <laughs> we would either, um, <laughs> we would either, and this is real, I'm not, <laughs> and, and um, we would, so we were very early on like instructed in these like dynamics of like searching in the body and being connected to the psychological emotional self. And so I think this was a very early influence for me in terms of establishing a connection to um, my physical body and my emotions. I also was a part of a traveling unicycle drill team as a child. <laughs> um, it was called the St. Helens School, uh, you can see a uh, unicycle drill team. And I present, this <laughs> I present this as a really big influence in my early life because um, as someone who was like queer and growing up gay and I was sort of put into wanting to do sports, um, having this like history of both learning a unicycle, and we used to travel and do performances to Neil Diamond, and we used to do all these parades, and that's actually my sister, uh, who's a CFO now, um, on the <laughs> left. <laughs> I like to pull these out sometimes. Um, but there was like a performance and acrobatics, and we used to sort of do all of these different things and go on tours. So I think this like influence of playfulness was very evident planted very early on inside of me and my upbringing. Mm -hmm. My parents basically raised me to be a really big weirdo, no, I'm just kidding, but I, <laughs> so I was a part of this unicycle drill team and um, right by where I grew up, there was this uh, Buckminster Fuller uh, dome uh, that was almost in walking distance of my childhood home. Mm -hmm. And so this dome was actually, it's called um, 
ASM International. Uh, I grew up in a town, it's called Newberry, Ohio, but uh, this is called the, it's this it's American Society for Metals. And what it is, it's a metallurgy society. And so underneath the dome, there's all of these different um, minerals and geology. And, and my exposure to uh, the art world and art in general was very limited because I grew up in the country. So growing up, I really thought that like a spaceship had landed here. It sort of was a strange architectural uh, building and I didn't know anything about uh, Buckmeister Fuller, but later on, you know, I think this early connection really formed, I think in my mind, um, a really strong connection to uh, pattern and architecture and history. Very early on in my childhood, I really thought I was going to be a mathematician. And in high school, I actually worked for ASM International in their engineering department, uh, plotting graphs for engineering science. And when I went into undergraduate, <sighs> I really thought that I was going to be a scientist. And so this connection, that's something else, this connection to science was very implanted very early on in me. So there's a side of me, I think, that is very connected to being very analytical, but then there's a side of me that is very playful, uh, that is very, very improvisational. And I think these roles are very much implanted in the way that I approach making work. Another strong influence in my life is that I think an early influence was um, <clears throat> I, my aunt had cerebral palsy growing up and my grandmother and her had a very sp a special connection where my aunt couldn't communicate with um, very clearly verbally. And so my, my grandmother and my aunt had a very sophisticated language in terms of communication, in terms of communicating with their physical body. So this observation for me and noticing their behavior and also modeling was also very influential for me in terms of, as we know, artists are very connected to their physical bodies. You could say that artists actually have a more sophisticated um, connection to their physical body, similar to athletes or actors or comedians, where um, for me this was very uh, influential in terms of almost considering my body being smarter than my mind. When I was in my 20s, um, I moved to San Francisco and was working for Creativity Explored of San Francisco, which I don't know if um, you know or not, but it is uh, one of the first uh, centers for artists with disabilities for art making. And so when I was living in San Francisco in my 20s, I was very much influenced also probably because of my connection with my aunt uh, to working at Creativity Explored of San Francisco. So as I was trying to sort of understand and find my language in terms of art, I was very much influenced from the connection I had with my aunt, but then also I was very connected to outsider artists, to this language of outsider or folk art that is, exists in my practice, but it really was implanted very early on for me in terms of this tension of trying to understand the difference between connecting this very formal way of learning and making art with this very real family history for me uh, that was a, of a different way of learning and making work. One of the artists that I had a experience of working with that I think was very influential was, was Vincent Jackson. And one of the things that I really connected to a lot with these artists was that they were very honest, straightforward, they communicated very directly with their physical body. There wasn't a self-consciousness that existed within making that you might find in a more traditional art institution. And so I was very influenced by uh, these artists that I had the opportunity to work with. Uh, this is a self-portrait that Vincent Jackson made of me uh, during the time that I uh, worked with him. And this is also uh, some zines that Harold Fletcher was making at the time. Um, and this is by Michael Loggins. It's called Fears of Your Life. And one of the things that I was most impressed by and also inspired by, by a lot of these artists was um, there, was a, there wasn't a self-consciousness that existed in communicating visual language. It was very uh, forthright. There wasn't um, something that I really identified with, which really I think was like a tension that started to exist within my early work because I felt like I had such a strong connection to outsider art, to folk art, that I was really trying to figure out how to transition that into making a life for myself in terms of making work. 
By the time that I had my first show at the MCA in Chicago in um, 2005, I think this is the altitude mind where you like can't remember dates. <laughs> um, I was really considering this question of material hierarchy and craft. Uh, why certain materials existed and were kind of deemed kind of like appropriate craft materials within the Art Canyon versus other ways of working that were sort of considered permissible. And so when I was in grad school at the Art Institute, this was the first museum show I did, I was really considering and experimenting with a lot of different materials. Um, and also at the time, I didn't have money to make art. So I sincerely was using paper, craft materials, things that were accessible because for me, it was really important to consider the importance of um, the ability of process and production, but uh, also evaluating these designations of why we classify certain things in different categories and how we sort of approach materials as either being um, of a higher end of production versus a lower end production. And so this question of materiality was really important for me because I felt like it was really a question of asking myself whether um, it was, I was allowed or not to use these materials. But then also I felt like for me, because I'm very connected to my physical body, I was very much interested in this idea of the studio being uh, a place of ritual, uh, but then also um, evalu evaluating these two different sides of myself where I felt as a queer artist, I didn't necessarily feel like I fit into a history of making, but then I also felt this really strong connection to outsider art. And so I was really sort of contending with this tension of trying to find a way to make work fit into these two disparate categories. You could also sort of say those designations exist in sort of an art language and also a craft language. And so I was evaluating for myself why it is that certain materials are deemed more serious, why, are, why it is when we look at certain materials, we look at them as appropriate for certain uses versus others. Um, and during this time when I was uh, beginning my early career, I, I felt like there also was a very strong drive for me to understand this relationship between where does the autobiography of who I am exist within the making. And so these early collage pieces were in some ways <clears throat> based on um, my upbringing as being very religious um, and Catholic was kind of like merging this idea of how do I merge this sense of process of collage, sort of a sexual self, with one of also being really invested in this question of why certain materials were used versus others. So this question of materials for me really became almost like something that I felt like I needed to invest in as a way for me to sort of access the sort of punk, punk um, rebellious side of myself. Uh, at the time when I was starting my career, um, uh, a prominent LA art dealer pulled me aside and said, Bill, if you really want to have a long career, you need to make more expensive art. And so I said, fuck that, I don't care. <laughs> and so I felt that there was this real side of myself that was, is very rebellious where I was like, wow, that's so fucked up. Like, why would you say that to me and sort of say like, you need to make work that's more serious. You need to make, make art that um, uses more expensive materials. And so there was this, and is this side of me that always exists, where I started, I created a series of sculptures that were actually a rebellion against this feedback that I was getting. And so uh, some of the early sculptural works I was making were actually made from the garbage of my studio dentress. And so I decided that I was going to sincerely invest and using the materials that I had at hand, but also really access this strong desire in me to sort of access a place of reverence or spirituality or essence that comes from the physical body. I'm not really an artist that does really well with giving details, so through my talk I'll try the best I can, but I'm just gonna show some of these early works that were assemblage pieces. Some of these actually were made um, from failed pieces that I kind of kept re recycling over and over again. And I remember I was watching a video with Susan Rothenberg where she talked about the patina of work and how she intentionally dirties her paint. 
And I'm sort of like, yeah, I don't want to make clean art. Like I want the work to be visceral and dirty and sexual and also to sort of reference my love affair with minimalism, which was something that I kind of felt that I was contending with, where there was a side of myself that was very much invested with transforming this pain of kind of contending with the spiritual sexual side of myself, but then also genuinely felt this connection to process and to uh, a history of minimalism that I still feel very strongly connected to. Um, by the time that I um, started using ceramics in my work, I had already really been really questioning this like question of material hierarchy and um, how that relates to like a, the way that we sort of interpret the seriousness of different materials or not. And so I had also I was schooled as an undergraduate in ceramics, but actually I was given advice in a different way that if I wanted to have a career as an artist that I should actually abandon ceramics. And so um, for many years, I actually didn't use ceramics, but after grad school, um, I felt that I was not damaged from getting my MFA, but I felt that there was like a real self-consciousness there, like a constipation. And so I felt that I needed to um, not take myself so seriously. And so my attraction to ceramics, I took a class at Lill Street, which was in Chicago as a community art center. And um, I didn't tell the instructor that I had an MFA or that I was an artist. And I took these ceramics classes as a way to extend my drawing practice into clay, but also kind of to really access a place in myself that was um, more genuine and playful and direct. I kind of was having this discussion with someone the other day where I think you can be serious in ceramics, but I think it's very difficult. I think ceramics as a material is very playful, it's accessible, and there was, those were things that I was really considering and thinking about. But also in the back of my mind, I kept asking myself this question of where, where does queer identity exist within minimal, minimalism? Where does identity exist within a minimalist history? Can you actually be a queer artist who makes minimalist work? I came across this really wonderful quote that was by Peter Volkos that sort of talks about ceramics being the meeting ground of painting and sculpture. Very early on, um, as we know, Peter Volkos had a time at the ranch. Um, I was very connected to the ceramics history of the physicality and, and sort of the process of making. But when I was an undergraduate at that time, uh, ceramics was really primarily dominated by um, I don't want to say misogyny necessarily, but there was a certain type of person that was making ceramics. And as someone who was queer, I was kind of like, can I be queer and make physical work? Is this even possible? <laughs> and so I was really evaluating. I was like, yeah, I need to be masculine because I'm, there's all these, we all sort of like classification of queerness, what we think queer art looks like. And um, I was kind of like, no, I think I really need to access this very physical, direct, very uh, side of myself in clay. And so Peter Volkos and Stephen DeStabler, uh, Viola Frey, and Robert Arneson were all very influences for me in terms of a ceramic history of making. By the time that I started creating these early works, my first, you could say, assemblage ceramic pieces that I kind of looked at as living, uh, breathing sculptures of my body, we're really uh, reaching a point where I was accessing this conversation of ceramics, but then also ceram uh, material hierarchy, and also an invested interest in collage. And so this first piece that I made was a ceramics table. Um, I kind of looked at as a living, breathing body. Um, the, the weight of this table is actually was the weight that I weighed at that time. And, um, it's actually titled the faggot table, um, but it's, it's called senatus table, which is in Greek. And so it was really kind of like this uh, balance between, you could say, embracing sort of these ideas of queer identity and minimalism, but then also really investigating this idea of how do we ex uh, exist with materials? How does materials exist and how can they uh, be integrated? And so I was really considering these early table works as being um, a form of living and breathing extensions of my identity and body, but also I kind of felt them as being related to uh, 
reliquary. There were like altar pieces contending with this question of where 2D and 3D exists within sculpture, but also really investing in this idea that clay historically is kind of like a, a nice liaison, liaison that bridges painting and sculpture, where uh, the material in, of, in and of itself has the adaptability to both exist in a very traditional way, or we could say in classical sculpture or in pottery, but then also investigating these tropes. And so these early sculptural pieces were these balance of uh, embracing these ideas of how classical sculpture can exist within work, but then also continually investigating this question that I had about material hierarchy. By the time that I had my first show at the Renaissance Society in 2011, I was really considering and thinking about um, how does identity exist within minimalism? Um, is that possible? Where do we sort of exist and see examples of identity and minimalism? And so the first show that I did of these ceramic pieces at the Renaissance Society, I was really thinking about this idea of um, imagined architectural spaces. If we think about the imagination and during that time, uh, the economy wasn't so great. There wasn't a lot of prospect really as a young artist thinking that there was be a potential. And so I was like, well, I'm still gonna make art. I don't really care. But I was thinking about this idea as the studio being a model for how I want to see the world. But then also these early pieces being, um, you could say architectural models that they're both uh, psychological and also physical models. And so this first table piece that I did in a larger scale, the Renaissance Society, I was really thinking a lot about Judy Chicago and thinking about this idea of where um, craft history exists with an identity and pieces that were made during that time, or not that time, historically that sort of represented minimalism and craft and identity. And so when I made this ceramics table for the Renaissance Society, I was really considering all of it being one big breathing collage of my identity and body. The pieces were all sort of like different ways that um, you could say the tropes of ceramics exist within making. So I sort of embraced um, very formal ways of using clay, which you could say is in a vessel form, but also uh, thinking about and considering different models of the way that we look at reliquary and vessel form and um, different uses of ritual and objects within the world. And the second reiteration of the, that I did of this table piece for the Neumann Museum, I kind of like thought about this like these tables as being these living and breathing kind of monsters that were sort of a demonstration of my skill and non-skill existing together. So I was like on one hand really considering this idea of what it was to be a good craftsman, but then also really embracing this idea of bricolage and performance and spontaneity. And this idea of really considering where we can kind of create a community of conversation within making. And so one of the things that I really feel that was a big part of this work was um, it, by, by using all of these different materials and processes that both embraced skill and non-skill, traditional ways of using uh, materials versus non-traditional ways of materials, uh, the sculpture in and of itself becomes a conversation for the viewer to ask questions about that while they're in encountering it. And for me, this was sort of like one of the things that I felt was really interesting and nice about the piece. It was an expected, but when you kind of interact and kind of move in and move out of the sculpture, you really start to sort of ask questions about for me, it becomes a question of how we look at materials, how we look at skill, how we classify different, let's say neoclassical primitive forms versus more higher level films and forms of modernism. Um, and for me, that was really important in terms of this feeling I had in myself of sort of not feeling like I found a place in the history of making. So instead of avoiding that, I felt like I was going to just show that to the viewer, that I, I did not have the answers, and that was part of the story of the work. Okay.
I'm still nervous with my talk, it's okay. Maybe it's like altitude or something. Um, so if I collapse, just, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I'm kind of shifting gears in my talk a little bit, just for a second. Um, just to sort of talk about, uh, earlier I sort of uh, touched on a little bit um, this sort of tension that existed growing up in a very uh, traditional family. I was the, uh, I'm actually the William J. O'Brien the seventh. And so there was this expectation of um, what the second son was going to become. <laughs> and I was going to be a scientist. And I, when I was an undergraduate, I was a math major. And I really had this, like, you could say spiritual crisis that existed at that time where I was experiencing a lot of pain that came out of uh, the person that the world was sort of expecting me to be versus the person that I was, was inside. And at that time, my mathematics professor was like, I was like, I'm leaving math to be an artist. And he was like, well, Bill, have you looked at fractals? And I was like, no, I don't want to make fractals. But actually later on, um, in terms of this negotiation for me in my 20s of sort of this like sexual side of myself with this religious self, it really forced me to kind of have to ask the question of what, what family is or lineage. And I've recently started to talk about my spiritual practice because I think it really does influence my work. This is Trungpa Rinpoche who belongs to, um, he's a lineage holder of the Buddhist lineage that I meditate under. This is Sharat Joyce and Patabi Joyce. I have a yoga and a meditation practice that I do. And the reason why I think it's important, I think, to sort of present this material is because I think as I sort of became to negotiate the space of the mind and the body, it really kind of became, my spiritual practice really became uh, the thing that allowed me to exist and enjoy, enjoy these two different parts of myself uh, that I felt was disparate. In uh, India, actually, I've traveled to India several times, actually, to study uh, with Sharat Joyce and do yoga. And um, in Mysore, India, it's a Hindu practice to do these daily drawings on the road every day. And there's sort of like uh, daily drawings that are done on the sidewalk in front of homes. They sometimes uh, reference Lakshmi or different um, deities within Hinduism. Um, but I felt like it was like this time that was like a bridging of where art could exist in everyday life, where drawing could exist in everyday life. And also that the fact that these works were made every day and then they would wash them away. And so when I start to talk about my colored pencil drawings, I felt like for many years it was really difficult for me to find the right language to sort of present it in a way that made sense between, besides it being just a formal thing. And so oftentimes when I approach making these drawings, um, I really do think about them as being, um, it's so coincidental that at the Aspen Museum right now, <laughs> They're doing a, a sand mandala, which I encourage you to go look at because it's only a week. Um, so this is a mandala. And so I really do think about uh, these color pencil drawings as being uh, time markers of my life, but then also that they are um, sort of mathematical in the way if we sort of look at how mathematics exists within nature um, and how when I approach making these drawings, I really, it really embraces a history that I value in the grid. And um, I kind of look at these in the same way as quilting. So there's a lot of underdrawing that exists within these pieces. But the patterning for me really, I think is really about the side of myself that is uh, very analytical, influenced by sound, music, and nature. Sort of merging with this very analytical side of myself um, that is about telling a story in form, that the drawing could actually be a time marker of my life, and that I really look at these drawings as being a time marker of my spiritual and psychological self, because they take time to make, and they also are a reflection of um, really transforming a lot of very difficult very painful things that have existed with, for me within my life. Um, this is the uh, Tibetan Wheel of Life. It's like a teaching wheel. Um, and so these drawings, I think, have similarities uh, 
in some ways, I think, to my spiritual practice, but I really look at them as in the same way that people write. They're really like these uh, time markers uh, that represent different um, times in my life, but then also I think are very much, I only came to this realization realized recently where I was like, oh my God, am I making fractals? But I think, <laughs> like it was only after like making these for like 15 years that I was like, oh my God, am I like making fractals? But like, I kind of was like really, um, uh, just really, really thinking about that there is this inherent influence in me that is influenced by pattern, uh, the sound of visual language, how visual language exists, how natural sound and visual language exists. But I don't really think about these works, I think about these works as being very connected to the physical body. How the physical body represents time, how we look at time and how uh, memory and emotion exists within the body. And in the same way, I really look at these as being about transforming very difficult circumstances. Just really quickly breeze through and avoided the beauty of everything. I was like, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, in 2012, um, my studio uh, had a studio fire that burned to the ground. And um, uh, it's taken me now actually uh, to feel very comfortable to talk about this in a public realm. Um, but I feel like now I feel like I'm ready to really talk about how this really has made an influence and affected my practice. And so, uh, my studio burned down in the fall of 2012. Um, there were several artists who had uh, studios in this building. And um, my studio assistant at the time was actually moving to New York. And he had a studio in the building and lost everything, including his personal belongings. And so when we sort of like encounter unexpected obstacle and loss, this can be a very difficult thing in terms of like how to form meaning or negotiate a way to sort of work through these different things that exist kind of unexpectedly. The first pieces that I had made after uh, my studio fire were actually these felt on felt works. I was really thinking a lot about uh, how we culturally transform loss and how loss exists. And at the time I was having a lot of um, difficult questioning going on in terms of uh, had different influences going on. We had close friends telling me that the studio fire meant that I should stop making art, that it was a sign. Um, and then I actually was having hand tremors. So it was actually very difficult for me to actually make work because my physical body was, my hands were shaking so much that I was trying to figure out a way to actually make art again. And through that process, uh, the first works that I had made during this time were these felt on felt works where I was like, okay, I'm just gonna cut one piece of felt at a time. And it gradually these works you know, evolved, I think, to be uh, a different conversation, but I was really considering this idea of queer minimalism. And I was thinking about the AIDS quilts and how the exhibition of the AIDS quilts in Washington, D.C. was in some ways uh, one of the biggest exhibitions of minimalism that sort of bridged this idea of the private and public self and sort of these things that I was uh, contemplating at the time. Uh, during this time also, I, um, I wrote a poetry book uh, and it sort of started as uh, just these lists that I was doing um, to very pragmatic lists of things that I needed to do that extended, extended into a poetry book um, that uh, led into these more uh, figurative tapestry felt doing. So there were the merging of the lists and the language of the poems that I was writing and kind of how difficult it is to use language in art. I was like, God, language is so difficult. And so I was considering, is it possible to tell story in fragmentation where we sort of like catch on different things that sort of touch on a narrative, but actually that the language becomes uh, a way to sort of think about uh, drawing as being a potential to, to tell a very uh, good open-ended story. By the time that I had my show after my fire called Wet and Wild in Marion Bosky Gallery in 2003, 
I was really considering this old self and this new self that was evolving. And so these felt on felt pieces were the first exhibition that I did that was, uh, it was like almost like I worked piece by piece, one at a time, to sort of start making these larger felt works that were exhibited together. And the front part of the show was, I could say, um, a demonstration of my old self. I felt like there was still this part of me that existed that was making the work that I had made. But then the second part of the gallery, I really considered and started thinking a lot more about how loss and memorial is, is exhibited, how we memorialize loss and reliquary. Um, and these new, these metal works were the first pieces that I really was thinking about. How do we deal with loss? How do we publicly talk about loss? Uh, because with memorializing loss publicly, uh, oftentimes it's very cold. And so I was really considering this idea of, is it possible to make warm, accessible, friendly work uh, in a material that would be normally very cold? At this museum survey that Larry talked about at the Museum of Contemporary Art, it was like this weird coincidence that my first major museum show happened right after I had lost all of my studio work. And so thankfully, a lot of the work that was found and exhibited within this show had been put into the world. But there was five rooms in the show, and the curator, Naomi Beckwith, who's an incredible person, uh, was like, Bill, we want you to make a new work for the fifth room. And I was like, God, I don't know. I'm so still recovering from the fire. And so I was really still considering this idea of the potential of how we could use everyday materials and memorialize them, but then also that they could serve as reliquary. So these first totem works that I made were really this, began this conversation where I was really thinking about how do we display emotion and psychology publicly? How, how do we negotiate loss? And how we sort of present loss publicly? Because oftentimes it's very relegated to a very private place. The last part of my talk it's just gonna be uh, briefly about some newer things that I've been doing. In Tibetan Buddhism, this is a Mahakala. And in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there's usually chants that are done in the morning. Uh, there's chants that are done at the setting of the sun. And there's evening chants. And the protector chants are done at the setting of the sun because uh, one could kind of consider that's a time of transition, but oftentimes uh, mishaps, sloppiness, imbalance happens at night. I guess it could happen during the day, but most of the time night is when we maybe lose awareness. And so the Mahakala in Tibetan Buddhism is a protector deity that really isn't protecting us from other people. It's essentially protecting us from our own demons. And at the time I was really dealing with, and still am, dealing with, was dealing with a lot of demons that I, uh, came out of my fire. And so I was really considering and attracted to the Mahakala because there was this part of me that was really struggling still with overcoming the fear of making new work. How do I overcome the self-consciousness that exists within that? And so the figurative ceramics that I were making at that time, this is another image of a Mahakala, uh, began this uh, series of works that I was doing where I wanted to reference uh, figurative ceramics, but then I also wanted to make uh, these protector um, figures. That also was kind of related to how we think about um, memorializing something. And so I was thinking a lot about cemeteries, uh, statuary, how that exists within a public realm. But then also really considering and thinking about this drive in me that is very attracted to drawing, to the physical body. And so the figurative pieces in this series were for me, kind of like uh, these representations of internal demons that I felt within myself that I had to reconcile as a way to not be afraid of them. Um, and the figurative pieces and these ceramics that came out of this series uh, really also were continuing this exploration that I've been invested in, in terms of how, we, how can we humanize loss how do we contend and publicly show loss and talk about it? Uh, 
how that exists within the physical body, where we relate to when we go to feel and experience loss, and also genuinely wanting to um, present a more human, real, messy way of uh, communicating that from the psychological body. And with that conversation, I began really considering and thinking about working in bronze. Uh, because bronze historically had this potential to be able to exist outside, but then also I really wanted to show this story of the mind and the body and how you could be able to um, humanize and display um, and memorialize something in a more human way. The last uh, slides I'm going to show are from um, the show that I recently had at Marian Boski Gallery in January. And these pieces are, um, I had just recently after my fire experienced a significant loss of someone very close to me. And so I was going to the cemetery and sort of looking at monuments and seeing how everything was like Helvetica typography. It was like in marble. And I was like, why does this exist? I mean, there is statuary that when we memorialize that is not uh, cold but I really wanted to sort of think, to show and make works that had a warmth and a presence that were able to sort of have an emotional connection, uh, but that were using material historically that um, is um, more rigid. And so oftentimes when I approach to do these things, like the foundry was like, what are you doing? I was like, but I felt <laughs> I wanted to really incorporate uh, drawing more in metal because I felt like that was something that I felt was really important. And so I showed a series of these color pencil drawings with these metal works and really thought of them as being atmospheric, that these were sort of living and breathing memorials, uh, protectors that uh, really related to um, this continual story that I've been um, negotiating after my fire about continuing to make art even though there is doubt, but then also that it does have the power to transform very difficult things. So this is it, I'm done. <laughs> Do you want me to go backwards? No. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was so nervous. So. Okay. Okay, well, Bill, this is wonderful. So. I have a question about being yourself because you are so deeply, wonderfully yourself. And we have a lot of students here who I'm sure uh, have many different paths to go and many different forces and influences on them. And I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about the tools you've used or the lessons you've learned that help you be yourself in your um, art. Um. Well, when you hear yourself on that iPhone message that you want to delete, that's a good sign because it means you're uh, getting uncomfortable. And um, I mentioned to Dennis today in a talk that I was doing, because he asked the question, what do you do when you are having trouble working in the studio? And um, the first thing is to recognize that art is very subjective and that t the tendency to be very serious can be very uh, counterproductive and that the physical body, I think, sometimes has the ability to snap us out of our neurosis. And so oftentimes I'm very fortunate that I can punch things in my studio because I work with clay, but um, Connecting to the physical body is very important. I teach at an art school, and I think there is a history of um, artists who are athletic, uh, but I think um, being very physical is a very good thing if you're a creative person. And so when I advise my students to go for a run or a walk or to exercise, it's really to balance out maybe neurosis or imbalance that it could exist in terms of doubt, um, comparing yourself too much to others um, and sort of like snap out of whatever's going on. 
And if I were to be frank about it, um, I, I think for most of my career, I was really um, thinking that what I was doing wasn't correct or evaluating that. And oftentimes you have to um, experience pain in order to really know who you are um, and to not avoid it. Every artist essentially wants to have positive feedback. Who doesn't? It's like kind of walking into seeing someone every day and they're like, you look really tired. And you're like, well, thanks. I'm not really... Um, but that self-consciousness is like you want someone to say, hey, you look really good today. <laughs> yeah, you look good. Um, but in order to sort of be yourself, you sometimes have to not... Uh, people might not like your work. And I think that's not a bad thing. Historically speaking... Uh, oftentimes, the best artists are the ones who are um, not um, publicly understood, maybe for a long time. So, I don't know if that helped, Nancy. I'm avoiding eye contact up here. So. <laughs> it was perfect. Thank you. Does are there anyone, questions? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah. maybe, I yes. do. <clears throat> I'm okay. Um, I was, I'm so impressed seeing how you you begin seemingly with such a personal investigation um, and wanting to um, explore themes that, that are important to you. But I'm also impressed that you tackle such universal, um, not only in, in terms of, of conflating different seemingly opposite points of view and things like that, but that um, you end up with something so universal that, that all of us can relate to. So is that something that you focused on or, or you just happened to, through your personal investigations, create these universal investigations? So the sense? question, I think I understand your question is whether it was intentional or not, the way that things arrived at the way they were. Are you just lucky? <laughs> <laughs> um, before I went to grad school for art, I was talking to my meditation teachers and I was thinking about becoming a social worker or a psychologist. And they said, no, Bill, you need to become an artist because you have to deal with all of your superficiality and your demons. And so I knew that, I, that taking a path of making art was going to be challenging, as it is for anybody, whatever capacity. But I knew that drawing and clay were materials that were more horizontal. And I knew that I wanted my work to have that connection and it was very important. So I would say there was a strong intention to the materials that I chose. Uh, the metal is something new that I'm still contending with, but I felt that it was important for me that my audience felt um, a connection in the material. Are Bill, you allowed you to ask a question? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> could, could you talk about shifting between uh, all of these media um, and whether it's hard for you to go from drawing to ceramic to uh, sewing, really, with felt and, and you know, moving back to, to uh, bronze and things like that. Could you talk about that and, uh, you know, how you got there and, and uh, you know, what it's like for you each time? Um. When I was, someone told me that I'm a tornado artist, I think that's the word, where you kind of grabbing, doing things. Um, I think that different materials have different um, tonality, both uh, in the way that you can transform them. And oftentimes, um, I'm very curious about the historical way that you're properly supposed to use a material versus the improper way of making work. And so part of the material exploration extends from a curiosity, which I, I, really, think, I really, really think of myself as a drawer um, and that drawing is the foundation of my practice and it's the rule that I consistently follow that allows me to kind of extend out into other materials. And rarely I think about uh, the other pieces that I'm making as, as a form of living drawing and um, oftentimes I don't really think about um, the disparity between them because I think about them as being similar to physical movement or performance. Um, but oftentimes that can be really confusing. And so 
I might just have multiple personality disorder, so. <laughs> So in Buddhism, there are these values of compassion uh, and wisdom and the transient nature of all things. And then you have the contrast with what the art world is often about, which is somewhat egocentric um, oftentimes. And then there's kind of a culture of object worship. So I'm wondering how you sort of deal with those conflicting worlds and if they conflict in your mind. And in that context, what your idea is of the function of the artist and the function of your work in the world? Well, I think in order to fully be, um, to work on yourself, you have to go into your ego, into your neurosis. And so the audience or context for that is very, um, it can exist within a specific context like the art world or it could exist in, um, other contexts of how you exist in the world. Um, I think that um, oftentimes I'll go to someone's house and I'll say, God, who made that drawing? And they're like, well, you did. I was like, oh. <laughs> um, and so I think a lot about who William J. O'Brien is. And um, sometimes we have a shell of ourself that we, when we, someone told me we identify with who we are based on by the time we put our clothes on in the morning, we're buying who we are. And so that becomes very specific. So I have these glasses and I wear this shirt. And so it's a very specific identity, right? As soon as I wake up, okay, you can either connect to that or not. Um, but oftentimes I like to think about in sports or this idea of when you're dancing for a long time, there's a moment where you're not thinking of your ego or your space, where you're in the moment and it takes a lot of discipline to get there. So I think that for me, um, I'm very disciplined in my studio practice to allow me to experience, uh, to be improvisational and playful. By appearance in my work, you could assume that that comes very easily, but it only comes through a lot of discipline. Um, and I think with anybody, um, any world has different good things and bad things. And so I think the best thing to do is to find your way in terms of uh, how much um, I have a tendon, I'm a sponge basically, so when I go into an environment like this, I'm like, and then I need to not talk to anyone for like two weeks. But um, uh, evaluating, I think for everyone in like as a maker, um, there's a skillfulness in determining how much and appropriate it is to um, expose yourself and then also compare because it's very subjective, like I said, there's like a craft world and an art world, and um, I think when you are truly yourself, your audience will come. So it's, um, I, I, I think that it's difficult for any world, not just the art world, it's like the world in general, how we negotiate that territory. I'm avoiding answering your question, but hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> We'll do one more question, yeah. Uh, Bill, you did a beautiful job of sharing your life and your art with us. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder if you've been back to Newberry, Ohio, and whether you can still ride a unicycle. Well, it's funny you say that because um, I'm not gonna put him on the spot, but my partner bought me a unicycle for my 40th birthday. And I could show you the videos, but we have time. But yes, I still know how to ride it. And it's my, in the studio, when I'm encountering difficulty, let's say, I ride the unicycle. So it's helpful. And um, <laughs> when I'm like really serious, worked up and very, you know, I, time to ride the unicycle for five minutes usually helps. So. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully this was helpful for everyone. Bill, thank you. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs>